So I want to thank God for Dale Grinstead. I want to thank God for Don Sumner. Faithfully, since I've been attending Southside, they have set up the old dark 6 a.m. men's prayer meeting. And let me tell you something. It has become a beacon of light for me personally. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Where's Don? Is Don in the house this morning? No? Well, thank Don. There he is back there. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Dale, for being faithful and, and, be, and, and prioritizing men's ministry at 6 o'clock on Friday morning. If you're here this morning and you're a man, uh, 6 a.m., 6 a.m., uh, Friday morning in the library. You go, oh, it's too early. Yeah, I know, but the Holy Spirit shows up, right? So at the end of the day, he never doesn't show up. Is that, isn't that right, Dale? And so uh, this past Friday, um, <laughs> one of my brothers said, the Holy Spirit whispered, That's, you got to tell that joke on, on Sunday. So I hope you're all right with that, brother. I didn't ask you for permission, um, but I'm going to use it. The, the, the joke goes this way. Uh, this gentleman passed away, and he's standing before the pearly gates. And the Apostle Peter is there controlling the gates. And uh, he asks uh, Peter, how can he get in? And, and Peter says, well, uh, you're going to have to answer the question why you should be allowed to be in or why we should open the gates for you to get into heaven. You're going to have to answer that question. Why? Why should you be permitted into heaven? And each of your answers are going to be worth points. So the guy says, okay, no problem. For 45 years, I faithfully attended every service every single week. The Apostle Peter says, okay, that's one point. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Uh, for, for 50 years, I faithfully tithed. I faithfully tithed 10% of my gross. Come on, take it up a notch. Of my gross, and I gave offerings above and beyond that. The Apostle Peter said, that's two points. Two points. He said, all right, all right, all right. Every month I went to the homeless shelter. I put clothes on people that had no clothes. I fed people that were hungry. And I, and, 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 and I, I ministered to them and I loved on them. He says, Apostle Peter says, all right, that's one point. He gets a little frustrated. He says, Dale Bartley, pray for me because I hope I have a good delivery here. <laughs> he, 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 says, he says, at this point, it's going to take the grace of God for me to get into heaven. Ding, 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 ding. That's the hundred point answer to the question. <laughs> As we continue here on our journey together towards experiencing a year of renewal, right? That's, that's the journey we're on at Southside, a year of renewal, if you remember. Uh, having most recently discussed the what, the who, and the where as it specifically pertains to the authentic Love of God. This morning we come to a message titled Authentic Peace. Authentic Peace. As we look to God's Word and the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit to answer the question, how can we experience authentic peace? As I've said before and will continue to say as long as the Holy Spirit prompts me to, authenticity is truly everything. It's one of our core values here at Southside, especially if we as individuals and as a church family really want to experience a year of renewal in our personal lives, in our families, and here corporately as a church family as we uh, affect this community uh, for Christ moving forward. When, when speaking specifically of authenticity, how many of us this morning also understand that it's not just a matter of us as believers and as a church body having the mandate to really strive towards being or living authentic. It is also equally true that the God who we serve and love loves us with unequaled authenticity. He loves us with unequaled authenticity. And because he does, he has incredible authentic benefits that he wants to give to us, that he wants us to receive from him. Amazing benefits for us as his children to receive. Psalm 103, 2 in the ESV says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his, his benefits. Authentic benefits that God doesn't want us to ever forget. He wants us to receive them, and he doesn't want us to ever forget them. How many know when the darkness gets dark, we tend to forget the benefits, right? Um, one of which is authentic peace. You see, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 26, 3 promised, God promised through the prophet Isaiah, you, God, will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. 
And Jesus, he, he put it this way in John 14, 27. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace, can I say authentic peace? Because he said, my peace. My peace I give you because he says, I don't give to you as the world gives to you. You know why? Because they give a counterfeit peace, ladies and gentlemen. So let's define, shall we, a little bit the authentic peace Jesus is referring to. Peace in the Old Testament is shalom. Shalom. I don't know about you, but every time I hear that, I get, I, I feel peace. You know, like, I, I experience it. Like, I had an old, a mentor of mine, every time I seen him, he would say shalom. I said shalom, you know. And so shalom means completeness, soundness, contentment, friendship with God. And peace in the New Testament is the word irene, which is a tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. We sang about that this morning, right? We have the hope of heaven. You know, right? We have the hope of heaven no matter what's going on, right? This is not our home, ladies and gentlemen. We're yearning for a, for a foreign land, right? We, we, we have a piece of it inside of us, but we, and it, it tells us we're not, we're not, it's not cool here. There's something better out there for us and up there. He's waiting on us. And so uh, Irene, peace in the New Testament, is a tranquil state of the soul, assured of its salvation through Christ. And listen to this part. I mean, if you have this on a regular basis, you need to see me afterwards. We, we got to talk. I got to pick your brain. Here it is. Fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot, no matter what sort that is, that's, that's authentic peace, right? Fearing nothing that God permits and content with your earthly lot, whatever it is. Ladies and gentlemen, are you further aware that in God's word we are literally commanded to pursue and seek after this kind of peace, this authentic peace. It's not my word, it's God's word. Look, Psalm 34, 14, turn away from evil, do what is good, seek peace and pursue it. That's shalom. Seek shalom and pursue it. And now in the New Testament, pursue what? Peace. Irene, peace with everyone and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. And something I discovered that I didn't know until I prepared for this message this week God's word takes it even further than that. In 1 Corinthians 7, 15, in the NIV, it says God has called us to live in peace. So we, as authentic Christians, are mandated by God to seek and pursue and live in authentic peace. It's God's will for you, my brother, my sister, right? So how's it going for you? How you doing, D? With that Irene, that shalom piece. How's that, how's that working out for you, my brother Linton? How, how you doing? You good? See me after, all right? We're, we're going to have pizza after, but after that, all right? Um, are you successfully pursuing, seeking, and living in the experience of the promise of authentic peace? Well, if anyone is like me this morning, I surmise you are, then you know uh, it's much easier said than done especially if you've been experiencing lately fear, stress, anxiety, depression, and an overall real lack of true, authentic peace. I mean, you get up, you do your devotionals, you read your word, and if you're like me, you're checking your boxes off. I, I want that relationship to be fresh. It's not always fresh, if I'm honest with you. It's a struggle sometimes. And, uh, and, and I stress out about the time, and I stress my wife out, because uh, she can tell when it really didn't mean anything that I spent an hour and a half doing what I, what I think is going to unlock this authentic peace in my life when I come out still <laughs> not overly nice. Um, and so did you guys know that it's, it's believed, it's, I think it's pretty much a fact, some of you theologians can tell me if it's true, but did you know that some of the, our heroes of faith, like Martin Luther, like Charles Spurgeon and Florence Nightingale and Mother Teresa, they all struggle with enduring mental health issues? and concerns, they all struggled with living in authentic peace. Like I almost fell off my chair when I read Charles Spurgeon, the preacher of preachers. And the, last, the latest research I could find shows that seven million Christians in the US experience major depression each and every year, which makes it safe to conclude that this benefit of authentic peace that God has for us can at times be quite elusive. Certainly, the research also shows that not everyone experiences mental health issues or finds help for them in the same way. So forgive me, I'm not trying to 
you know, step on anyone's toes or saying that that's the case this morning. But my prayer is, is that what God has placed on my heart to share with everyone this morning online and in-house would be helpful, even if it's just to one person. I, I don't think the church, and I, and I don't like pointing out negative things because I got a plank in my own eye, you know what I'm saying, right? But I don't think the church overall has done a good job of speaking about mental health um, from the pulpit, not least in my 30 years of experience. And so, and so uh, I'm going to focus on one possible reason, okay, as to why many Christians may not be experiencing God's promised benefit of authentic peace. This is a reason I've personally uh, experienced and personally know of people who, that I love in my personal sphere of influence that have and are currently struggling with this one reason as to why the authentic peace of God eludes them. Uh, the one that we're commanded to pursue and live out daily is not their reality, and it was not my reality in seasons of my life. Uh, and, here, and here it is. You ready for it? You're listening. Say amen. 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 Here it is. One of their hands, one of their hands is stuck in a monkey trap. A monkey trap. Let, let me explain what a monkey trap is. It's not a, a, an empty box of Kleenex. A monkey trap is usually made out of a coconut. It could be made out of a bucket. But the hole in the trap is only big enough for the monkey's empty hand to fit into, okay? Inside there, he's grabbing for something that he wants, that he believes is gonna bring him peace, you see? And so he takes his hand empty, he shoves it in to there, and he grabs a hold of it. And how many know when he makes the fist, he can't get his hand out of the trap? And this trap is adhered to the ground or a tree, okay? And all he's got to do, ladies and gentlemen, and if this is all you get this morning, this is enough. All he's got to do is let go of the bait and he can free himself. But how many know the monkeys wind up being killed for their skin and their meat because they do not let go? They refuse to let go of what they believe is going to bring them peace, right? Obviously, they don't say it that way. They're hungry, right? It's probably food. But you know what I'm saying, right? How many times have you run in the middle of the night to get some food to bring yourself some peace? Come on. <laughs> don't lie now. You're in God's house, <laughs> right? So you, you understand the monkey trap, right? I first heard this illustration a few months ago while reading and studying and teaching from the book, crazy little thing called Marriage. If you're in the marriage class, you'd have heard this already, and if you did, forgive me for using it again. But I can't stop thinking about it because it's a powerful illustration of truth. And so, and so uh, unfortunately for me, there have been times in my life when I was convinced that what I was, what I was holding on to was my answer to experiencing real authentic peace. But all it really was was a monkey trap. And I wish I could tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I wish I could tell you that it was easy to let go of it was not easy to let go of. I wish I could tell you that it wasn't painful, and, and, I, and I wish I could tell you that uh, it didn't last very long, and I, I, I quickly released, but I did not release. And uh, the fact of the matter is, is that initially, because that's what sin does, right? Initially, there was some peace. It was not authentic peace. It was, it was worldly peace, and it, and it lasted momentarily as soon as I, I grabbed a hold of it. Uh, but soon enough, how many know it, it wears off pretty quickly? And, and I started becoming filled with fear, anxiety, stress, and painful circumstances multiplying all around me. All because I was imprisoned by believing, by placing my faith in a counterfeit peace. I, I imprisoned myself by choosing to believe in a counterfeit peace. Therefore, again, today's theme is authentic peace as we look to God's word and the Holy Spirit's illumination to understand the question, how can we experience authentic peace? peace as we look to God's word I said and the Holy Spirit's illumination we need him we need him listen I may be going right to the end right now in this moment we need him to show us as individuals what the bait is we don't figure it out on our own we need him to do that so we're going to look at God's word this morning in Matthew 19 16 through 17 just then someone came up and asked him asked Jesus Teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, he said to him. There's only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep 
the commandments. Which ones? He asked them. Jesus answered, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother and love your neighbor as yourself. I have kept all these, the young man told him. What do I still lack? If you want to be perfect, Jesus said to him, go, sell, all your, sell your belongings and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard that, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word this morning in your life and in my life. In context, our text this morning starts off with the words just then, referring to Jesus having had just left Galilee and entered into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan as a large crowd followed him, a crowd containing but not limited to Pharisees who were testing him with nefarious questions, and his disciples were following him as well as other uh, adults with children and questions as well, which subsequently led uh, to uh, Jesus publicly correcting his disciples from attempting to prevent the children from coming to him. See, people were bringing their children to Jesus for him to lay his hands on them, and the disciples said, no, no, no. And this is what Jesus said in Matthew 19, 14, just before this man approached Jesus. He said, don't, don't try and keep the little children from coming to me because the kingdom of heaven belongs to the, such as these. This specific story, friends, we're discussing this morning is found in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And each account provides additional information. Matthew, which is the one we're reading this morning, describes the man who approaches Jesus as young and wealthy. Luke calls him a ruler. This story, I believe, contains some powerful truths that can help us to answer the question, how can we experience authentic peace? Starting with, we must consistently acknowledge that we cannot save ourselves. By, number one, embracing our human limitations, ladies and gentlemen. Verse 16, the first one was, someone came up and said, teacher, what good must I do? Emphasis, I do, to have eternal life. This question demonstrates that this man, like all people by nature, have an orientation towards earning eternal life. He wanted to know what good work of noble deed he could do to inherit eternal life, what he could do to get saved. Just tell me what to do. He most likely, I believe, was a bit rattled and confused and discouraged by hearing the statement Jesus made that I just read to you about how children, uh, that the kingdom of heaven belongs to children, he was rich, he was strong, he was in charge, and he had to figure out how to become a child, and he, that befuddled him a little bit, I believe. It's quite possible up until that point, he was feeling pretty good about himself and his eternal destiny. Um, he was most likely so confident in himself, he approaches this Jesus, a miracle working at this point, powerful, truthful, fearless, growing in popularity, public teacher with the mindset, as I just said, just tell me what to do, and I will do it. I'm young, I'm rich, I'm powerful, and I'm very confident that I have what it takes to do what needs to be done. It reminds me of the apostle Peter, right? When Jesus was talking about being crucified and, 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 and that people would betray him, and Peter said, never! Not me. No way, no how. I will die for you. I will never betray you. And Jesus, of course, says what? You're going to deny me three times, right? Reminds me of me. I know you're stunned by that, right? Uh, especially as a young teen, on way too many occasions, I was way too self-confident. As I was preparing, God brought me back to the time when I had a mini bike. Anybody ever have a mini bike? Anyway, we, we lived on a, on a busy street and uh, uh, I had a pretty big backyard. I had already run the mini bike through the neighbor's fence uh, because uh, I, I made a ramp one time and I didn't know how to turn quick enough to get, I made it too close, Linton, to the fence. I was not an engineer in the making, okay? And so I ran through the fence and now I begged and nagged my poor mother to death to let me cross the street and go over into the woods to ride that mini bike. And all the kids in the neighborhood wanted me to do it because they wanted to ride on it. And she finally relented. And how many know I got hit by a car? <laughs> Went flying into a bush. I could have been killed, but God spared my life. Um, he knew you'd need to hear what I was going to say today. 
And so, and so, and so, uh, but anyway, the point I'm making is, is that I was convinced, right? I was, I was fearless. I was convinced I, I could do it myself. I didn't need any help. And uh, I, I, I was reckless in my approach to a very, could have been a very serious situation. By the way, I did not tell my mother I was launched and hit by a car because I wanted to go back into the woods. But how many know people get pretty rattled, adults do, when they hit someone's kid and they figured out who my parents were and the phone rang. And uh, I don't remember ever riding my mini bike again uh, <laughs> out across the street. Anyway, um, just recently, a man of God that I know, ladies and gentlemen, just said almost the same exact thing as this rich young ruler said to Jesus. He said to me, he goes, I'm just waiting, Rich, on God to tell me what to do. Whatever it is, I'm going to do it. Friends, I sure hope this man means what he's saying uh, and is truly prepared for God's answer. Because how many know that God promises in his word in Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. It's not a matter, therefore, uh, if God speaks, uh, but when and what exactly he's going to say that's most important. And here's a hint for you, if you're not aware of this, it's probably not going to be something, man, woman of God, that you're really looking to hear. Especially if you're 100% surrendered to his will. He, he's going to stretch your faith is what he's going to do. He's going to bring you out into a place that you don't really want to go. So most times I hear people saying, I'll do whatever he tells me to do. They already know in their mind what they want to do. Yeah. And that's what they're hoping to hear. But a lot of times God don't bring that. He brings something else. It's how I wound up in front of you this morning, as a matter of fact. And so um, many Jews back in Jesus' day believed that a specific act could win them eternal life. Therefore, this rich, young, powerful ruler who had everything this world could offer, he clearly demonstrates uh, that having obtained it all has not granted him any true, authentic peace in his soul. He also demonstrates that he completely failed to grasp and understand what Jesus meant about childlike humility and complete dependency on God alone, right? He said, just tell me what to do, and I will do it. Additionally, ladies and gentlemen, the ab in the absolute sense of goodness required to gain eternal life, this man cannot see the reality that only God is good and we as humans are not. By approaching Jesus in this way, the young man reveals simultaneously that what he truly wants, as I just said, is something really beyond God's will. He's not feeling good. He doesn't have any peace because he's not ready to obey. Oh, he wants heaven, ladies and gentlemen. We all want heaven, but he wants it on his own terms. He wants it his way, like Frank Sinatra. We want it on our own terms. We want it our own way. He's convinced he already has what it takes, therefore he wants to use his God-given earthly talents to earn it. He's failed to remember and personalize Isaiah 64, 6 in the NIV, which says, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. He simply cannot fathom he is not capable of doing the right thing in his own strength, according to his own intelligence, by his own experience, his own generational pedigree, his own self-discipline. To his credit, though, let me give him a little bit of a break here. This young man does not have what we have today. He does not have the letter to the Ephesians the Apostle Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which declares in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for you and me, we're, we're saved by grace through faith. And this is not from ourselves. It is a gift from God, not from works, verse 9, so that no one, not you, not me, can boast. God gets all the glory, as we sang this morning. Unfortunately, because he believes his salvation is in his own hands, he doesn't have the experience of authentic peace. And this is true before we even first get saved ever, and it is equally as true if we've been saved for 65, 70 years. Pete Scazzaro said, gritty self-effort can only take us so far in the transformational process. We each carry deep defects of character that will be changed only when we surrender to God's divine surgery. No one volunteers for surgery, ladies and gentlemen. If you do, you need to see me. We need to talk about it, all right? How can we experience authentic peace, consistently acknowledge that we cannot save ourselves by embracing our human limitations. Isaiah 64, 8, we are the clay. 
God, you are the potter. And we all are the work of your hands. How can we experience authentic peace? Number two, consistently ask Jesus to help us to see our true inner selves by embracing persistent soul-searching prayer. Soul-searching prayer. How can we see the speck of dust in our own eyes? Man, I can see your speck of dust back there. I can see it, but I can't see mine. But I can see yours clearly. How come that is? How come you can see mine so clearly, but you can't see yours? Verse 21, here's what the man said. What do I still lack? I still, I know you told me to follow these rules and the commandments, and I believe I have. But there's something still not right. He persists. He doesn't take his answer and just run off and say, okay, I just got to follow these commands. I'm good. I, I follow these commands. He's, but he recognizes in the moment he still does not have the peace. He's, the shalom, right back then, the shalom he was looking for. He knew he lacked something. He knew. And he knew that, that, that he lacked something in his relationship to God. He went to the godly evangelists, right? The, the healing, miracle-working Jesus. And he was hoping that he would illuminate, reveal to him what he was missing because he wanted shalom. You want shalom? You need shalom? I want it. It's promised to us. We should be able to experience it. God's word is true. His promises are yes and amen, but we're not experiencing it as often as we should. If we want authentic peace, authentic peace is the fruit of righteousness. It's living our lives in a way that pleases God. That's right in his eyes, not our eyes. This man wants his way. He won't really want God's way. We don't have peace because we're not willing to surrender to the truth of what God wants us to let go of. Therefore, he does do a good thing. He wisely persists at asking Jesus. We prayed a lot this morning already. We're going to pray more. Don't get scared. God is going to set people free online and in the house. He's going to reveal the truth to you for your life this morning. It reminds me of David's prayer, which has been echoing in my soul this week. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me. Lead me in the way of everlasting. Jesus actually told a parable pertaining to this very principle in Luke 18. He said, now he told them a parable of, on the need for, for them to pray always and to not give up. There was a, you guys know the story, a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God. He didn't respect people. So he wasn't, he wasn't about, he was not interested in loving God and loving people, right? He, he didn't fear God. He was not a believer. And a, and a widow in that town kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. And for a while he said, no, lady, buzz off. Uh, he said, but later he says to himself, even though I don't really believe in God, I don't really fear God or really care about people, I'm the judge, right? I'm in charge. Uh, yet because this widow keeps persisting, I will give her justice so that she doesn't wear me out by persistent, her persistent coming. And then the, Jesus brings clarity. He says, so listen to what the unbelieving, the unjust judge says. You listen, believers, to what the unbelieving judge says. Learn a lesson in your sphere of influence from those that are carnal, from those that may not even be believers. God may be speaking to them or trying to speak through them to you, to me. So don't always close your ears off because they're not believers, right? Jesus says, will not God grant justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay helping them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? What? In other words, will Jesus find authentic followers praying persistently, faithfully awaiting their answers? Your answer for peace. Have you given up asking Jesus, why, why can't I experience real peace in my life? The peace that surpasses understanding. Why can't it guard my heart and my mind? How come I'm so overwhelmed by all the darkness around me, all the pain? How come I don't taste it? You promised I would. It's in your word. I'm supposed to pursue it. But it's not been my experience, God. How can we experience authentic peace? We must consistently ask Jesus for help to see our true in ourselves by embracing our need, 
by embracing our need for persistent soul searching prayer. We got to stop looking and blaming other people. We got to ask God, what is in my eye? Please show it to me, God. Please show it, it to me, what I can do for me. God is trying to heal you. He's trying to deliver you. He's trying to set you free. He's trying to give you authentic peace. Last point, somebody say praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Last point, how can we experience authentic peace by consistently when we love, all of us love this, embracing God's correction. I love that picture. Oh my goodness, help me out. Yeah. How cool is that? That's me up against the door, I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> On a regular basis, that's me up against that door, and God is like, Rich, really? Really? Come on. <laughs> Jesus said in verse 21, if you want to be perfect, by the way, don't freak out about the word perfect, okay? The word perfect here means completion. It does not mean absolute perfection, okay? Only Jesus is perfect. Completion. He says, Jesus says to him, if you want to be complete, if you want authentic peace in your life, go sell your belongings and give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. Stop the presses. What? What? Now we finally get to the bottom line. And, and we get to the bottom line because this man persisted pressing the question. He didn't get frustrated and walk away. He, didn't, he, didn't, he kept asking, something's still not right, something's still not right. You keep going to the doctor, right? If you have a fever and it doesn't go away, right? You, or your pain is in your back. Where's my sister I prayed for this morning? I, I'm believing for healing in her back. Anyway, you keep, there she is back. And when you, when, you, when you keep having pain, you keep asking your doctor, right? You got to put me on a different medication, I guess. Right? Well, you don't stop. Why do we stop asking Jesus? Why, why do we stop asking Jesus? And so... Jesus reveals this man's monkey trap bait. What is he holding on to, ladies and gentlemen, that he can't pull his hand out, that's about to kill him, that's about to take his life? It's, it's materialism. Materialism is the bait that was placed inside the monkey trap and has this rich, young, powerful man imprisoned, lacking any, any authentic peace whatsoever, any assurance of heaven. Church, the radical absolute goodness, the authentic peace he is seeking is God himself. It's God himself. See, God will brook no rival for the young man's attention. He will brook no rival for your attention, for my attention. This man's wealth impedes him. This man's wealth impedes him. Likewise, what are we holding on to? You see, Authentic love, which is who our God is, it never demands, right, our attention. It never demands our loyalty. God's not pushy, um, but he will not play second fiddle. Authentic peace can only be experienced when God alone is the first fiddle, in the first fiddle spot in our hearts. Therefore, here it is. You ready for it? Every disciple must be willing to dispense with anything. Say anything. anything. The master thinks will impede their walk with God. God, listen, God may challenge and require an individual Christian to give something up for the sake of the kingdom that he still allows someone else to have. I was, I was debating if I should tell this story to you, but I'm going to let it fly. We already cast the demons out of this place. I struggled with alcohol. I was in the Navy, right? Right? I was, a, I was a grown man, and I was, in, I, was, I, was, I, was a, I was a sipping saint. And I'm not trying to convict you this morning if that's you. I was a sipping saint. I was a cop in the real world, but I loved Jesus. And I dabbled with alcohol until we had an 80s party in my backyard. And I wore baggy uh, MC Hammer pants. Don't judge me. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and, 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 and there was alcohol in the... There was alcohol in the uh, cooler the next day when I was cleaning up, still left over. And I was able to drink and be cool. And I was able to drink consistently every now and then, no big deal. But I heard the alcohol calling me the day after when I was cleaning up. And then I heard God's voice. And this is what he said to me. And I'll never forget it. If you ever want to fulfill my perfect will, 
in your life, you will stop drinking alcohol. If you want my best for you, for you, Richie, you put it down. And I will promote you, and I will bless you, and I will take you places you never dreamed. Here I am, right? Ladies and gentlemen, here I am. Here I am. I'm not saying you got to stop being a sipping saint. That's between you and Jesus. What I'm saying is, for me, he clearly told me it was, it was my monkey bait. It was my monkey bait that I was holding on to, trying to gain acceptance from man, my fellow cops. You want my perfect will in your life. If you want to reach my potential that I have for you, you will put it down. And I put it down by the grace of God. I put it down two decades ago, never have picked it up again. I, I found out after the fact, I found out after the fact that if you want to be in the Assemblies of God ministry, you can't drink anyway. <laughs> I, when I filled out that question, that was the only question I got right on the test. No problem. God already took it away from me. Hallelujah. And so how can we experience authentic peace? We must embrace God's correction. And in conclusion, let me just do the recap. You know I like to recap. How, 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 how can we experience authentic peace by embracing our human limitations? We cannot save ourselves, ladies and gentlemen. we got to stop thinking that we can. And I'm talking to people in this room. We struggle with that still. Uh, by embracing persistent soul-searching prayer, you got to ask God, where, I, where am I missing it? Where, where's my blind spots, God? Show me. Show me. Show me what I'm holding on to. If the circumstances in your life are not getting better, if the mountain's getting taller, wider, and thicker, you're holding on to something. Your hand is in a monkey trap. You have no peace, and God wants to set you free. You're going to get the answer by persistent soul-searching prayer. you got to go to him. you got to ask him. And number three, you got to be ready to receive God's correction. This man, in conclusion, unfortunately was not ready because we've already determined he really didn't want the will of God. Do you really want the will of God? In your life? Do you think it wasn't, was easy for me at the next cop's party to say, I, I can't drink. I'm not drinking. It's not easy. It's not easy, but what, what, what do you want in your life? You want God's best in your life? Or you, or you want your, 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 you know, your so-called friend's uh, acceptance in your life? This is verse 22. When the young man heard that he heard that, to sell everything and give it to the poor and then follow Jesus. He went away grieving because he had many possessions. The young man leaves grieving, wanting to follow Jesus, but clinging to his addiction to materialism. He's holding on to the bait with a clenched fist. He's refusing to let go and be saved. Church, treasure in heaven alone lasts. Treasure in heaven alone lasts. Treasure in heaven alone lasts. The one thing that we each preserve above all costs, the one thing we hold on to above all costs, reveals our true affections and our true values. Materialism was his God, and he was guilty of idolatry. Spurgeon, Spurgeon said this. He was so confident in himself that he would be saved by works, yet he would not carry out his works to the full of the law that the law demanded. He failed to observe the spirit of the Ten Commandments. He observed the letter of the law, not the spirit. And Jesus asks for the spirit of the law. He loved not, he loved not his poor brother enough to get rid of his goods. And he loved not God in Christ Jesus with all his heart and soul. What he loved, what he worshipped, is the bait that he held on to. That's worship. What are you, what are you holding on to? What is more important than God in your life? And what were these many possessions in comparison of authentic peace, of conscience, and mental rest? For this man is now miserable even while he possesses them. And so will every soul be who puts worldly goods in the place of the supreme God. Every soul who grabs a hold of anything refusing to let go in an effort to obtain peace. Any and everything that is not the authentic Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ himself. Worship of holding on to counterfeit gods equals counterfeit peace. Worship, holding on to the authentic God equals authentic peace. 
In fact, the very reason we are commanded to pursue authentic peace, as well as why it is also God's perfect will for us as his children to live in and experience his authentic peace, is found in Ephesians 2.14. You know what it says? Are you ready for it? Say, I'm ready. ready. For he, Jesus, is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord this morning. It is time to let go of our idols, our sin, in search of authentic peace. It's a dead end. And here's what we're commanded this morning to do. You ready for it? Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. Since he who promised is faithful, And so I said, God, give me an illustration that can speak to this very point. My wife helped me with the Kleenex box, okay? So my hand is holding on to the monkey trap. You got it, right? But what does it say I have to do in order to be, in order to overcome this? We just said it. Jesus is our peace. We got to hold on to Jesus, who is the confession of our hope, right? The confession of our hope is Christ in us, the hope of glory. So how do we do that? We let go of the bait, right? We take out our hand, and we grab a hold of Jesus, okay? Now check it out. You can't go back. It won't fit into the monkey trap, ladies and gentlemen, because you're holding on to the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. You can't go back into the trap as long as you hold on to the confession of your hope. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus, and the authentic peace you're looking for is found in an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, also known as this, the Spirit of Jesus. Jesus, you hold on to Jesus. Your hand can't be in a monkey trap. You know, I've been, the last few weeks, I've been, I've been uh, ending the service with a song, okay? And we're going to do that again. But I just want you to hear my heart, and I want you to hear God's heart on this as well. Last week, when we did that and we went to the song, people hung out in the sanctuary and were talking very loudly. God's at work right now in hearts of people, and people need deliverance in this church, in this room, right now. People need healing in this church, in this room, right now. I'm asking you as your pastor, when we open up the altar and we play the song, I will, after the song, I will pray a benediction. Even after I pray the benediction, please quietly exit the sanctuary. Even though I don't say it every week, that's my heart. God's doing amazing things up here in the hearts of people and even out there in your seats. You don't have to leave. This is going to stay open. But I'm asking you, don't have conversation in the sanctuary. God is doing work here. We need to respect the Holy Spirit's work. We need to understand that people are at the end of their rope. They, they, they have unsaved loved ones. They're dealing with physical ailments, and they need healing, and they need the power of God. We don't want to get in the way of that by distracting them. Do you hear my heart? Yes, so we're going, to go to this, we're going to go to the music. We're going to go to the song. What are you holding on to? Are you ready to be free this morning? Freedom is in the house this morning. Your freedom, your deliverance is in the house this morning. Hello, my name is Pastor Rich, and I wanted to say thank you so much for watching and engaging in today's content. If you made the decision to follow Jesus, we want to celebrate the incredible decision that you made. All you have to do is let us know at southsideag.com connect or click the link in the description below. We would love to walk this journey out alongside you. But don't let the journey stop there. We would love for you either to subscribe, share, or support. If this ministry has blessed you at all, subscribe so you don't miss out on any new videos. Share it with a friend. You never know what the people closest to you are going through. Or you can choose to partner with us through generosity, which helps bring these videos to people like you. Thank you so much for connecting with us. Have a blessed day.